it is an exceptional honor for us to have Professor David Gan, Pro Vice Chancellor of Development and External Affairs at the University of Oxford and Chairman of the UK Atomic Energy Authority in our midst this evening. David is an accomplished leader in academia and business, specializing in innovation strategy, technology management, and fusion energy development. He's an esteemed author, entrepreneur, and advisor in the fields of innovation and technology. His remarkable background includes prestigious appointments and accolades for his contributions to the engineering and economic sciences. So David has generously prepared a presentation for us, right? And I would like to extend a warm welcome to him to come forward to the stage. Please give a round of applause for Professor David Gunn, please. Ah, keep going. There we are. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Jerry, thank you for that um, introduction. And Chair, thank you um, for um, being here and uh, making this very convivial space available. It's, uh, it's really nice um, to be in this space. Um, look, I'm going to just speak for a, a few minutes about fusion, and then uh, we're going to have a Q&A, and I'm really happy to open up on questions and, and go a little bit wider into innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, it, it's curious, isn't it, that fusion in some parts of our uh, society is coming back into, into frame, and I'm going to try and show you why um, and give you some thoughts on how uh, we might see fusion being made into reality. Uh, let me just ask, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about fusion energy? So quite a lot of you, but then I'm going to just explain a little bit about what it is in a minute. Um, before I start, just watch this uh, graphic uh, for a few minutes, two minutes, I think, or less. So this is the average global temperature um, each year from 1880. Now, this is a wonderful graphic from, um, I think NASA developed it, and I pinched it from their website. And look, things aren't too bad um, most of this time. And soon I was born now. Um, I didn't make it that hot, just coincides. But when we get to 1980, Things start getting a bit hotter. And then 2000, just watch this. Now you should start getting really scared. Because when we look at this and tip it up, look at this visualization of global temperatures. Now, if you take a pan of water and put it on a hob and turn it on, and go and walk away and come back. You can put your finger in it for quite a little while and you can't notice too much difference. And what this graphic shows you is the same thing. You can put your finger in here and yeah, what's going on? The molecules are not getting that excited at this point and it's not heating up that fast. Problem is, the last bit when you put enough energy in and it heats up, it then <laughs> starts to boil. The Earth has started to heat up, as you can see, from 1980, 2000 onward, in a way that is very much more difficult to remove. And this graphic at the moment is only going in one direction. And this is the demise of the human race and most of the living things on the planet. So we need to take this really, really seriously. This, this graphic is as bad for us, or worse for us, than the indications that we started to receive of the pandemic of the COVID crisis. And I just want to rub this in. We are not taking this seriously enough. Society and governments everywhere in the world have not gone into the sort of mode that we could go into to deal with this problem. There's one more. I just want to frighten us once more. Right. 
So if you look at the energy consumption um, up to 2020, what you'll see is coal, oil, and gas, by far the most dominant means of producing energy around the world. And if you look at the last 20 years, you'll see a 50% increase in the use of fossil fuels. Now, what did I just show you? The graph showing the last 20 years of warming up. We knew this was happening. Yet, we've increased by 50% of the thing that is causing it. So, I really don't want you to have to extrapolate off this the next 20 or 40 years. But I'm sorry to say that the things that are happening in renewables at the top of this graph are not taking a, sh a big enough share of the energy market to make any difference. So uh, if I put this another way, we've got about 11,000 days to 2050. And <laughs> everyone knows that the leaders of the world have said that we want to get to net zero by 2050. If we can, we want to hold a global temperature rise by 1.5 degrees, but it looks unlikely we can do that. If we are to hit um, this target, we need to displace about 11,000 megatons, 11 gigatons of oil equivalent in our fuel mix. So you see the black, orange, and red. Um, to rem remove that today, let's forget, that's, that's the 11, 000, uh, 11 gigatons. Let's assume that between now and 2050, all new energy demand is met by renewables or nuclear. So just to get rid of these lines, you've got to build the equivalent of one nuclear power plant a day, every day, for 11,000 days. If you don't like nuclear power, you'd better build the largest offshore wind farm ever built every day for 11,000 days. And that will cost about 10 billion pounds, dollars, whatever you want to call it, about 4% of global GDP. Now, do you think that's a cost or an investment? I think this is an enormous investment opportunity. And that opportunity has to be realized, and we have to start doing it right now. We're so far off the pace, I'm sorry to depress you, but at the moment we're opening up more coal-fired power stations, we're putting more crap into the atmosphere, and we're making the problem worse. So at some point we're going to have to really take seriously this crisis and anything we can do to decarbonize. In fact, all of the different renewables and options are gonna to have to be accelerated um, into practice. You're gonna ask, what the hell has fusion got to do with this problem? <laughs> I'm gonna try and say that, first of all, um, fusion is not gonna solve the immediacy of climate change. But we behave as if 2050 is some endpoint and no one does any thinking beyond it. Well, if we accelerate to 2050 with growth in, I mean, let's just take the continent of Africa, uh, which is going to have huge demand for power, we're going to have to electrify far more. And once we get to 2050, we won't get close to, to net zero, but let's hope we get somewhere on the journey. We're going to need even more and more electric power. And sometime or another, we're going to need fusion working because, as I'm going to show you, it's the densest form of power known to science. And it could be made available in a clean and safe way. And so what I'm doing with the, my role as chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority in the UK and with the scientists at Oxford and Imperial College and several other universities is working on a program that's going to try and accelerate the delivery of fusion. Now, if you wanted to ask a clever person um, a difficult question, you know, who better to ask than Stephen Hawking? Um, what world-changing idea, small or big, would you like to see implemented by humanity? And he said, this is easy. 
I'd like to see the development of fusion power to give an unlimited supply of clean energy. So, I mean, if it's good enough for Stephen Hawking, that's good enough for me. <laughs> he said that in 2018 um, in his last book. For those of you um, who know a little bit of physics, um, this is what fusion is. It's completely the opposite type of reaction from uh, how we make nuclear power at the moment. So we make nuclear power by splitting atoms. It creates an enormous amount of energy. Um, it's not so difficult to do these days because we've been doing this um, since the late 1940s. Um, Calder Hall, the world's first nuclear power station, was developed and operated in the UK. In fact, um, uh, colleagues way before my time uh, invented nuclear power in the UK. Fusion was known about, Einstein knew about fusion, that if you were to force two um, atoms together, you could create uh, a new one, and you would create an awful lot of energy. And in this instance, uh, two fuels, deuterium and tritium, could become helium and a lot of neutrons with a lot of energy. And that primarily is what we're talking about. This is how the sun works. This is how the power of all the stars work. And it, as I'll show you, has a number of attributes that are really, really useful. Um, first of all, it's low carbon. It doesn't produce or emit anything in its process that would cause us concern atmospherically or in most other ways. Secondly, it is almost inherently safe. So when you fuel a, a, a normal nuclear power station, you put these uranium, energized uranium rods into it, and you want to put quite a lot of fuel in so that you don't have to open up and change it, and it will just keep running. Uh, the big question for managing a nuclear fission power station is to control the rate of that reaction um, and, and not let it run away. And the thing that people in the public uh, uh, and sometimes others worry about is a runaway um, uh, uh, escalation of the process, which would cause uh, a really, really big radiation problem. And I think that's in the public mind still. And we saw with Fukushima um, <coughs> uh, the concern that happened in, in Japan. Um, and there are, of course, other examples where sometimes it's gone wrong. I think our engineers and scientists are pretty good. Um, we, we've been running nuclear power plants for a long time. Um, they're pretty safe. Um, one thing, though, is that they do produce long-lived uh, radioactive waste, and we still don't quite know what to do with that, and that can be a big headache and a big cost. Fusion, if it were working, would be thoroughly reliable. Um, it doesn't require it to be a sunny day or a windy day for, as other renewable sources. And it could be inherently sustainable because the um, fuel that we need is readily, readily available. And you don't need very much of that fuel. It's very efficient in use. Click that. So um, just to give that sort of sense of how much fuel do you need, uh, a bathtub of water uh, contains enough deuterium um, and then the batteries, uh, in two batteries in, in, in a laptop uh, contain enough lithium to provide all of the power that you or I would need for most of our lives. Um, that really is very, very little resource compared to 1,600 barrel loads of coal, for example. Um, and, of course, there's plentiful water and we can get deuterium from that. Why is it a problem? Well, we're talking about putting the sun in a bottle, the sun in a little vessel on Earth. And, you know, the sun is a very big object with a lot of gravitational forces. And it's that force uh, that allows it to create fusion to happen. We can't create those sort of forces in that way on Earth. And so we have to use much higher temperatures. 
And we're talking about temperatures 10 times the temperature of the center of the sun. How many of you think that's possible today? No? Well, I can tell you in, in a number of places in the world, but particularly just outside Oxford, probably about every half an hour when we're running our fusion machine, we're working at 150 million degrees Celsius, which is 10, 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. So a little machine in the south of Oxfordshire is hotter than anywhere else in the galaxy. And on one of our machines, we're now using uh, supercooled magnets and cryogenics. At two and a half meters away, we're operating at four degrees Kelvin. It's the biggest temperature differential anywhere in the galaxy. And that's pretty awesome engineering. So although it's difficult, we're now managing to um, create and sustain uh, fusion in these machines. And we have a number of challenges. And I'm really pleased to say that the, the sort of design envelope of challenges has become much, much more contained in the last five years. So in five years, the world has made more progress in developing reliable ideas for fusion than in the 25 or 35 years beforehand. And there are some interesting reasons for that, which maybe I'll disclose a little bit in questions and answers. Um, some, of the, some of the big issues here, materials that can withstand extreme temperatures, um, how we extract um, a lot of the heat, the control of those fuels that are hotter than the sun, how we maintain a machine reliably using robotics, and how we manage to take that energy and make electricity with it. And, you know, I'm going to show you why this becomes really interesting for entrepreneurs. Because in dealing with these deep tech, deep science issues, we're getting results that have adjacent applications. And those applications can already go into markets and create value and spin out companies and so on. So whilst our, our goal is to make a fusion machine uh, that produces electricity, on the journey, we're creating a lot of value and a lot of expertise. This um, is the world's largest scientific collaboration ever. This is ITER, which is a, a collaboration to make a fusion demonstrator prototype without putting electricity on the grid in the south of France. And it involves 37 countries. And not all of them are easy bedfellows. You can see with the flags here uh, that you've got Russia, the EU, um, India, Japan, Korea, uh, the United States. It's really quite a, a problematic collaboration. And good old Britain is not in there now because you know, we fell out of bed with our European friends. And, you know, I'm going to show you a few more slides, which I hope will give enough evidence to the claim that the UK is the number one leader in fusion science and technology at the moment. Um, it's the only time when I go to the US and give a talk, um, I did one with the Department of Energy, and they actually acknowledge that the UK is ahead in one area of science than the US. Uh, the only thing afterwards they say, watch out, in five years' time we're going to catch you. <laughs> but, you know, we can be quite proud that we're ahead. The problem for this project is that they can't finish building it without the UK. And for geopolitical reasons and our own stupidities, which please don't quote me on, we're not part of this project in, a, in, a, in an obvious manner. We have to go through a back door to deliver. Anyway, um, just to give you some sort of sense, I hope this is a video. I want to see if you can click on that and make it start as a video. Yeah. So uh, this is a fly-through of this. I mean, you've got to love science. When science gets together and, and collaborates, it does awesome things. So this is 80 meters tall, this building here. And um, bring my neck. It's the biggest switchyard in the world. Um, this, this facility is built under French nuclear regulations, so it is completely oversized 
for the purpose because it's, it, it's designed to protect from something that's not going to happen, which is um, a, a fission-type explosion. But as you can see, when you get inside the installation hall, you'll see uh, some of the vessels. And there are so many world records in making this. Um, these are huge D sections for the inside. And I mean, if you're an engineer like me, you just gotta say this is beautiful. Um, <laughs> but this is a huge um, machine that is put together with less than millimeter tolerances because it's a vacuum vessel that's gonna operate at extreme temperature um, with huge magnetic forces. So the magnets, this is magnetic controlled fusion. If you want to ask me about other forms of fusion, you can do afterwards. But this uh, magnetic containment vessel has the most powerful magnets anyone has ever built. And any one of these magnets will pick up an aircraft carrier. So, you know, crazy strength of magnets. So uh, this is in construction at the moment. Um, it started a long time ago the late 1980s. This is actually an old design. It's a design that science has overtaken in the intervening period. And we think that this is going to work. We will learn quite a lot about how to manage the intricacies of fuel and fusion by turning this on and doing the experiments. But the, some of the excitement has gone away now because we've already superseded this um, in other designs. And part of that is, is what's happened in, in the UK. Yeah. Because the UK has pursued its own particular fusion strategy. Oh, can you go back one? Never mind. This is, this is the world's leading fusion magnetic confinement machine. What I was going to show you on the slide, um, I would just say, you know, we've developed a fusion strategy with the government uh, to actually build out from the science through technology to commercialization. And one of the things we've done is created a regulation that is very innovative and fit for purpose. And that regulation is going through Parliament. It's had its second reading. I think it will land very well within the next few months. And that's made us very, very attractive. So from a government policy point of view, and I know in Singapore you have a very, very good innovative disposition to creating the right conditions for things to happen here through government. Um, you know, that's what happened in the UK. It happened actually in the pandemic, in the creation of the vaccine and other responses. We were able to innovate in the regulatory environment that allowed us to move fast. We've actually got that far now with the standards and regulations for fusion. And that started to attract inward investment with private sector fusion companies coming in. The other reason, um, I've shown you the, the jet project there, um, and I'm just not quite sure what has happened to my slides because <laughs> I can't go backwards easily. Can you go backwards for, for me once? I'm not pushing it. And it may be that, yeah, there we are. The other reason why... Um, uh, people are coming to the UK and why we have some confidence is that it's the only place in the world that you will find the laboratories for the different subsystems and sub-elements um, all in one cluster on one campus. It's certainly the largest capability in terms of numbers of scientists and technologists working and engineers working anywhere to be found in the world on fusion. And we have laboratories that run First of all, off the back of the joint European Taurus, which is the world's most successful um, magnetic confinement fusion machine. It was the one in the, the, the little video just now. Um, it's a dear old machine, 40 years old. It's about to be decommissioned. It just broke um, another world record. Um, but, you know, that machine has taught us everything, and not least because it's the only machine in the world that uses deuterium and tritium, which is the real fuel fusion so we've learned an awful lot about that and on the back of it we've created this lovely device here um, the mast u which has allowed us to exhaust the hot gases uh, out of the machine and give confidence that we won't melt it down 
and I can say a lot more about this because it's a smaller, more compact design, uh, which in a pathway to commercialization is going to make it much more viable. We have one of the world leading materials research facilities with hot cells, which means we can work with irradiated substances and develop new materials. And funnily enough, we find that the satellite industry, the space industry, is really interested in booking time in this lab because the sort of uh, irradiation that they, degradation they suffer in materials in space is very similar to some of the issues that we deal with in a fusion machine due to neutron bombardment. And so one of the spillover benefits of our program now is to help bolster the next generation of materials for space. And then we have the only fusion component uh, test manufacturing facility in the world. And this is in Sheffield, in Rotherham, in the manufacturing cluster, right next to Rolls-Royce. And we just opened this. And it will allow you to test two meters by one meter components, not just the individual materials, but the weld joints, uh, the way they interact with each other. We have Europe's most powerful civil laser, which we fire at it. We're working in 14 Tesla uh, magnetic forces in a vacuum in this vessel. And do you know what? we suddenly get the, the fission, the ordinary nuclear industry saying, hey, can we test components in your machine because we haven't got one? So we're looking to double the size of this facility. We're already, already making money from industrial application use as well as doing our own um, testing in there. We've just opened the world's biggest and, and most advanced tritium handling um, laboratory uh, on the campus. And of course, you know, we're dealing with hydrogen. And a lot of people are talking about the hydrogen economy. And do you know how hydrogen, when it's in pipe work, corrodes those pipes? Who's got the labs to do that, right? Well, people are suddenly becoming very, very interested in how we handle this stuff because we can learn very rapidly. Uh, we're seeing similar um, uh, features. And, and then we've got advanced robotics and an incredible capability coming together in digital twin. So one of the reasons why I think we have done more in five years than the last 35 years is because if you add all of this together and you can model digitally, which we can now, you can accelerate the pathway. Um, you fail much more quickly in bits than you do in atoms. So we're able to get there much more quickly than we could do because compute power is so much better. Now, you've seen that. Let's move on. This is um, the uh, most advanced design. It won't mean much to many of you. But if you think about a donut with a hole in the middle, that's how a typical machine looks. And what it means is you have magnets wrapping around the middle as well as the outside. And those magnets cost 70% of the cost of building the machine. And of course, it's a big machine, so the magnetic forces where you want them in the middle of it are not felt so strongly. So we decided to make a very small cross-section, a very small aspect ratio machine. It's much more like an apple. If you think about an apple with a thin core. And the rest of the world, all the scientists said, yeah, don't be silly. You're going to just melt it down. It's too hot in there. And we said, right, well, we'll go after controlling the heat but we're going to make it small because otherwise the magnets are going to cost too much. No one's ever going to buy one of these things when we've got the prototype working. And uh, the beauty of this is that we designed what is a lovely little machine. Look at the size of that. Um, it won the Royal Academy of Engineering um, Project Award two years ago. And this machine, we turned it on. This was the, this was the modeling that was done in the lockdown on a computer. So normally the temperature curve is the red one. And this is the curve that is going to melt the wall of the machine. And we said, if we're going to make this machine operate, we need 10x. We called it the Super X diverter to work um, with the temperature felt on the wall uh, as the blue line. And that was what the model was. And then we designed the machine. And there aren't many science experiments where your theory and your experimental results match that closely. 
And what we've shown is that we can control, reduce that temperature curve by 10 times. In fact, we've now gone to 25 times. And everybody has woken up to this um, in the magnetic confinement fusion world because they now realize there's a route to perpetuating a machine without damaging it. Unfortunately, the ITER project, that biggest scientific collaboration in the world, was designed long before we had this breakthrough. And so uh, one of the reasons why I can say some of these things are superseded is because science has moved very, very fast in the last few years. Now, just to end my talk, um, let me just share a few other uh, issues about the spillovers from this. So we we built this very fancy um, place called RACE, which is remote access in challenging environments. It's another way of talking about robotics. And when I started as chairman five years ago, uh, there were less than 30 people working on this. And then we built this new facility. We've now got 350 people working there. We have spin-outs. We have Oxford University's Robotics Institute working with us. We have autonomous vehicles. And, you know, it all came from uh, that beautiful old machine when we had to refurbish it. We redesigned the inside, and we, we didn't need to use a robot to do this at the time, but we decided to train robots to re repurpose 60,000 parts inside a machine. And the amount of knowledge we learned from this was absolutely awesome. Um, it was so incredible because we developed haptics, which you can feel less than a millimeter. We developed a control system outside of the hot area with sensors that could withstand uh, irradiated environments inside the machine, with ports that allowed us to move materials in and out. Reason for this is that we want to keep up time. Once you've got a machine working, you don't want to have to stop and wait it to cool down before you go and replace parts if something goes. And so you need robots, robotic availability. And off the back of this, we have developed a massive range of robotic applications. Um, the Boston Dynamic Spot the Dog, for example, you've probably seen these. Well, we've customized this. We've got a, um, our own IP. We, we developed a nice little doggy jacket, which allows its sensors to be protected in irradiated environments. So we've now sent this into um, where we store our nuclear waste in Sellafield. And we had to go into a place that, um, when there was a, a problem um, a few decades ago, they locked the door and no one went back in there. We sent Spot in there to go and find out what was going on. And we're now working on all sorts. This boom arm here, this was a spare one from Jet. Um, this can pick up nearly a ton with less than a millimeter's deflection with incredible accuracy. So we've repurposed one of these um, and we've developed it for recovering um, the debris in Fukushima. Now, to my massive surprise, uh, I was on the campus and there were two coach loads of Japanese people from TEPCO um, looking at our robots. And I thought, why are the Japanese in Britain looking at robotics, right? <laughs> we're always buying robots <laughs> from, from Japan. And it just turns out that in very specialist areas in these challenging environments, we've been able to get robotics to outperform anyone else. And now we have the space industry really interested in this because, of course, if you're going to manufacture on the moon, if you're going to uh, manufacture satellite parts in space, you're going to be in the same conditions. You don't want to put a human in there. Uh, you'll never put a human in there. And you've got to have accuracy and controllability and line of sight. And, and so our robotics area is expanding very rapidly. And we're seeing spin-outs happening. And this is all on the journey to, um, to making uh, one of these machines. And this is the design uh, of the machine that uh, we have, will complete the design phase next year. We're on target with that. And we're just creating a special purpose vehicle. Currently, it's wholly owned by the Atomic Energy Authority. But it's being prepared to take out uh, as an investable public-private partnership vehicle, which will then build and operate uh, what we hope will be the world's first fusion uh, power producing plant. We might get beaten by some others because there's a race on now. And um, 
Oh, I'm struggling a little bit with the clicker. So the other, hey, I didn't touch it. Right, let's stay on this one. So the other good news is that two years ago, two and a half years ago, we wanted to seek a site to build the world's first fusion plant on. And we set a competition. We had to work with another government department. And we had 15 uh, bids from around the country, north, south, east, west, right the way from Scotland down to the south of England. And we chose five, um, which we then shortlisted down to two. And the Secretary of State chose West Burton. And this is currently the site of a coal-fired power station. Uh, this area here looks like grass. Well, it's six and a half million tons of fly ash pollution. Uh, it's just absolutely an industrial desert. And we've got to do a huge cleanup. You can see it's a very large site. Our power plant is going to be a very small part on that site. Um, the reason why we chose it is because it's got a, a direct train rail head, which is good for cleaning up and for bringing uh, supplies in. It's got a river with a license to take water for a power station, so we can already build a power plant with a balance of plant and have water cooling. And it's got a direct line connection to the transmission grid, which allows us to produce power and put it out there. And so we, we've just taken control of this in April, acquired the site, and we're preparing it now um, with our design, and we're putting our industrial consortium together uh, to build out on that. And we have um, a lot of work going on on our main campus with uh, about 36 universities working with us now, producing people with PhDs in the right area and so on. We haven't got enough people, I have to say. And about 40 companies working on the campus. We have an industrial cluster coming together with about 4,000 supply chain companies. And we're trying to build what will be a new to the world industry that will be able to create uh, fusion machines closely re related to some parts of oil and gas sector and the current nuclear industry. While we've been doing that, um, the private sector has really got going. You can see the first uh, Princeton Fusion Systems back in 1992. And then in the last two years, we've seen five billion, five billion is not a lot of money, it's a lot of money if you haven't been doing it before. Five billion invested, and all the ones in green happen to be located in and around us in Oxfordshire. So, you know, we have some claim to, to being the fusion private sector cluster, uh, as well as the lead in science. And those two, thi two things go together, obviously. Um, one of the reasons why these private sector firms want to be with us is because we're creating a regulatory environment that is very suitable. It means it's much easier to design a machine. And the second reason is that we have the laboratories to test everything that makes it cheaper. And the third reason is we have a lot of the talent. So there's, a, there's a, an agglomeration of talent. Um, and those are the reasons why I think we're starting to see stuff focus um, in the UK in a particular way. So I think I'll get to leave it uh, at that point. And I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. And um, uh, Sharanya, you're going to ask me some questions. I do think we, we, we perhaps end up at some point in, in what uh, might this mean for Singapore, um, which is uh, what I'm interested in asking you, but also having some thoughts about. But should we have a discussion? Yeah? Uh, thank you, David. May I just ask you to remain on stage? So um, thanks for insightful sharing. And um, what we are going to do is really challenge you today, right? Um, our next step is to really introduce someone exceptional to lead a discussion with David. So it's with absolute pleasure to have Ms. Sharanya Pillai as our moderator who will post thought-provoking questions to David throughout the evening. Sharanya is a correspondent with the Business Times a Garage Portal. Her expertise lies in reporting the tech and venture capital landscape of Southeast Asia. Additionally, she pens the monthly column Off Tangents, exploring fascinating realms of science, psychology, and beyond. I will now extend a warm invitation to Sharanya to commence our discussion. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks, Professor, for that fascinating presentation. I mean, just the idea of you know a, a sun in a glass jar, you know, and having the the kind of energy that powers our stars actually become a reality here. Um, super fascinating stuff. So I'm sure everyone has um, a lot of questions for the professor, but just to kickstart the discussion, I'd like to ask you a bit more about your personal journey into this field. Um, you mentioned that you started out with about 30 people at, at the Atomic Authority, and, and now you have over 300 people. Can you tell me more about your journey towards taking on the chairmanship and you know what personally inspires you about fusion power? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, let me just, sorry, don't want to confuse you on the numbers. Just the robotic center started with 30 and we now have 350. The, the main workforce in the fusion side of the Atomic Energy Authority is nearly 3,000 people. And it was around 1,000 when I joined five years ago. So, you know, we've grown three times. Our budget has grown three times. Um, our workforce projection uh, for the next three to five years is another 3,000 people. Those numbers don't sound that big. But put it in the context of what we call the Golden Triangle of Oxford, Cambridge, London. We're right in the middle of that triangle. Um, we have really strong AI growth in, in tech companies. We have a world lead in some areas of quantum. We have a, a burgeoning life science um, capability. And we have some other really strong work in materials and energy transition. So trying to get another 3,000 people with the capabilities that we're talking about to do this stuff is going to be really tough. So um, I'm, I'm projecting forward from your question that one of the, the biggest challenges as, for us is not money, it's not science, it's going to be availability of talent um, when we need people and, and having talent at the right level. And I'm sure that will ring true in certain areas in Singapore. But to your question, what, what, what was my journey? I, I woke up one day with a massive shock and surprise to find that I'd been appointed as chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority. So I read physics at A-level. Um, I always loved physics. I was a bit of a physics nerd. But, you know, I'm a civil engineer in my first degree, a, a builder, bricklayer builder. And I just couldn't believe that I got asked to chair this. And... Um, I did have to go through a process, and my work be before then, um, I'd been the chairman of the Smart London Board, and in fact, years ago, I'd worked in Singapore on smart cities with your government and, and colleagues here, um, and I knew about how to mobilise on innovation in complex areas, and that was my, both my academic in, uh, area and my interest. And the government didn't want another uh, nuclear physicist to chair the authority, not that there's anything wrong with, you know, high-energy physicists. Um, uh, there's a brilliant one in the room. I'm not going to say anything uh, rude at all here because I really believe we can't do any of this without them. It's just that the government wanted someone in the chair who was going to move the organisation into a new place based on an understanding of innovation processes that would lead from science through technology to commercialisation. And fortunately for me, I had that background in my experience and in my academic work. And uh, it, yeah, it was a, a daunting challenge. I happened to be in a phase in my career, finishing as vice president at Imperial College, where I could indulge a lot more time. So I spent a year just immersing myself in the different labs that are at the authority and, and learned a lot. Um, and I learn every day I go there. Um, uh, luckily, the colleagues are very helpful and bear with me and don't ask me too many deep science questions. <laughs> but no, it, it was just a, a big wake up for me to be uh, appointed, I think. And, and uh, I've been very proud to be a leader of that organization for five years. Since that time, there's only one person on the executive and on the board who predates me. Um, and that isn't just because I'm a chairman as a shark who just <laughs> wipes out boards, it's because we had to repurpose the whole authority to point it in the direction um, that we're heading at the moment. And so I did a big board refresh, and the executive was totally refreshed, except the chief executive, Ian Chapman, who is, I think, the most knowledgeable and capable person in fusion anywhere on the planet. And he's a brilliant leader. And we're very fortunate to have Ian. And the place wouldn't work without him. 
Right. Yeah, it sounds like a really exciting journey, I imagine, with a very steep learning curve as mm. well. Absolutely. Yeah. And in the past five years of your chairmanship, how have you seen sentiment around fusion power evolve, um, yeah. especially with the record set in 2022, like you mentioned? Yeah, well, Sharani, I really like the way you're using the words fusion power. So when I started, it was the nuclear fusion project. And I have no problem personally with nuclear and nuclear power. And I think, you know, the world, as I showed in the opening slides, we're going to need more of that, and we're going to have to be careful, but we're going to have to do it. Um, and we're going to have to deal with the consequential waste that we produce. Um, but nuclear has some um, issues in terms of public image. And so, you know, we had the luxury of being able to remove the word nuclear from fusion and call it fusion energy. So, you know, that's not a, 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 a misnaming, it's, it, it's true. It is still a nuclear reaction, but it's not one that immediately people think about Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or Fukushima, because that sort of problem could never happen um, in the sort of machines that we're using. I mean, the amount of fuel we put into a machine is enough for nine seconds. And as I said, the big problem you have with a fission reactor is controlling the reaction, stopping it becoming a runaway. The big problem you have in a fusion reactor is keeping the, peep, keeping the thing working. You know, it's just damn hard to keep the fusion process going. So your, your biggest problem is, is that it will just stop and you have to start again. And you know, um, So I think the, 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 the how we get public interest in this, you know, it's an awesome thing for our kids to think you can put the star in a bottle on Earth. Um, isn't it awesome? And we're getting there with it. Um, and that should encourage a lot of people to come in um, to what will be in the next 30, 50 years, a major world industry, I think. Um, and we have to try and uh, be sensitive to the fact that people won't understand this all the time and we have to try and explain it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also been a proliferation of companies that are innovating in this space, as you pointed out, many of them are located in Oxfordshire as well. Yeah. Um, I imagine you get a lot of questions from investors, I imagine perhaps even SG Innovate. What kind of questions are they asking you? Yeah, well, first of all, in terms of companies, I mean, I focused in my talk on what we call magnetic confinement. So you're using magnetic, magnetic forces in part to create those conditions that happen in the sun uh, through gravitational pull. There are other ways of creating plasma, creating a fusion plasma. And, you know, um, there's a spin-out company, First Light Fusion, from Oxford, which uses uh, um, an impact. And it comes from, um, uh, inspired from nature, there's a, a clapper crab that stuns its prey um, by snapping its pincers. And actually, it happens so fast, it creates a small um, plasma bubble. And that is enough to stun a fish. And they said, well, if we can create that using a bullet or a projectile against a fuel, we can create a plasma. And we might be able to create a fusion machine that way. And so that's one of the startups. It came out of Oxford University from the physics department. And it's just building its new, just signed up to build its next machine on the on the Cullum campus on our Atomic Energy Authority campus, and they're fundraising at the moment. Tokamak Energy is a spin-out; it's another magnet-type device from the Atomic Energy Authority. General Fusion is a very different type of company. It, it was the Canadian national program. It span out. It uses it's a bit like a diesel engine actually. It uses compression to control the plasma. Um, they're building their next machine on our campus. Uh, they've gone hundreds of millions in funding rounds. And there are about 50 um, companies now in the private sector. There's, there's probably three or four which have got uh, over a billion dollars and some of them $2 billion in investment. And they've, be, they've been really the ones who've gone through the big rounds and most of that money has come from the very wealthy um, Bill Gates, uh, Peter Thiel, these sort of people, um, with some sovereign wealth money coming in. Um, and some oil and gas money, actually. 
uh, any the Italian um, oil and gas company has um, put money into, f into Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which is the MIT spin-out. There's another tier which uh, are in the hundreds of millions, and then there's most of these companies are still in the tens of millions. We're still not seeing a lot of venture capital coming in, and I think it's too early for venture capital in the, in the mainstream. Um, it's too risky, and the pathways are not clear enough. And if you look at the machine we're going to build at West Burton, we'll need £10 billion pounds for that. Um, that's the sort of money, it's patient capital over the next 15 years. That sort of money, British government will put some in, maybe one or two of the oil and gas majors will put money in, and maybe Sovereign Wealth and Temasek and uh, organisations like that will put money in for those. I think we're starting to see venture capital money coming in to the spin-offs. You know, where you start to see robotics, um, well, there's a, there's a nice AI company which came out of one of our um, sensing um, data analytic processes called Luffy AI, and, and they've got um, a niche in, in developing their AI algorithms, and they're looking at other uses, and they've got VC money. So I'm not seeing the mainstream venture capital going into the core fusion at the moment, but I am seeing it going into the uh, adjacent areas, which, which are creating new, new industrial purpose along the side, which is really exciting. Yeah, yeah, it, it is super interesting how you mentioned there have been spillover benefits for other industries yeah. as well, like space research and, and so on. I mean, if you take CERN, everyone knows CERN, Geneva, you know, the particle accelerator. Well, again, you know, that's a big science. So we're talking about something very similar in terms of big science here, endeavours, which you, huge resources, long, long timescales to, to do experiments, huge capabilities. Um, but if you take CERN, you know, they've, they've had probably not as many as we would expect, but they've had quite a number of startups that have come out. You know, proton beam therapy, I think you can trace back to CERN. And, you know, these are really important breakthroughs that happen off the back of big science. And so one of the reasons why I'm so excited personally is that I've always been interested as an academic studying um, how do you get ideas out of big science into society, into the economy. And, you know, those are the things, these are the reasons why we need these big programs, because they do generate huge capabilities. You know, the World Wide Web came out of CERN, right? Tim Berners-Lee was trying to find a way of, com uh, of communicating with all these crazy physicists and ends up saying, well, we need a web and started working on those protocols. And, and that's where it came from. Uh, and so, you know, let's be inspired by what's going to come out of these fusion programs. I think we'll see some amazing things come out of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting that you raised that and also the nature of the project. It's so international, multiple countries are working on it together with, like, for example, the ITER project. Mm. Um, what role do you see the Singapore ecosystem potentially playing in fusion power? Well, I could put the question back to you in Singapore. I mean, you know, you have um, a, a big question about energy here, and as I understand it. So uh, uh, you've got choices at the moment, but at some point, um, to be self-sufficient in your own way on energy, you're going to need a, a, a highly dense energy source. Now, it's lovely to look out of the windows. I was at NTU this morning, and I saw, saw the photovoltaics on all the roofs. And I think, you know, we're still seeing breakthroughs in efficiency and, and uh, reductions in cost in making photovoltaics, I expect we'll see much more. But at the moment, the physics tells you that you don't get the energy density that you need. I, actually, at my home in Brighton, I have a photovoltaic array. I've got quite a nice size house. And I'm at this time of year, for six months, I'm almost off the grid completely. I have two Tesla batteries. That's fine if you've got a big roof and you can have a lot of land and the sun comes up enough times. But for, for vertical living here, you're just never going to produce enough of photovoltaics. And so, um, you know, one of these small fusion machines, one or two of these would power the whole of Singapore. You don't need a nuclear license site to put it here because it's never going to do any damage like a potential risk of a fission machine. And, you know, the answer may be for Singapore to collaborate more quickly 
with the big programs like this one in the UK and, and, and do it together. You know, I'd love to see a demonstrator plant built in Singapore and we find a way of working together to do it. And also develop the industrial skills and capabilities and the spillover effects. It would be just a tremendous opportunity. But I'm not in power in Singapore. I'm not particularly in power in the UK. I would just love to see that happen. I think, I think this would be a really good destination to do a, um, a prototype. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah, I guess if there are any members in the audience who have ideas, you, you can look for the professor after the talk. Um, yeah. And looking at the prospects for the private sector in innovating in fusion power. Like you mentioned, there is a rather high barrier to entry. It is very costly and uh, mainstream venture capital is not really coming in at the moment. What are the opportunities for people who are interested to innovate in this field? Well, I think, you know, it, you've got to be pretty brave and very clever to set up your own company in fusion, but a number of people have. Uh, Nick Hawker did in First Light Fusion from Oxford. Um, we've got um, a company called Helion Energy in the US, which is a different form of um, uh, device. And, you know, they've developed uh, a relationship, just announced with Microsoft, that Microsoft want to help invest in them to really accelerate the development of their machine. They put a massively audacious goal on the table to say that they're going to put 50... Um, a very small amount of power, 50 kilowatts, into Microsoft by 2028. Well, that would be wonderful to see. Um, if the physics works, uh, the machine is going to be more, uh, a more simplified version than the one we're designing. But the scientists don't know if the physics is going to work yet, and they're only four or five years out. So, um, but these people are really extreme entrepreneurs. You know, they're, they're, they're the modern version of Elon Musk. They want to set up a new industry and say we're going to beat the incumbents. Someone, I'm really happy with that. You know, someone has got to get fusion working really soon if we're going to stop that global warming issue. You know, I didn't say it, but let me just say it. Fusion is, well, nuclear power plants and fusion plants are really the only power source that can be put anywhere. I mean, fusion is even more simple to put anywhere. It can be put in the, on the middle of the equator, can be put on the ice caps. You could use it almost anywhere. It, it, it doesn't rely upon a lot of resources to operate. Um, and, you know, it's usable day and night. There's not many sources of energy that don't have big supply chain um, or requirements that you can cite um, almost anywhere. And, and that's one of the beautiful things about it. Mm -hmm. Do you see any misconceptions around fusion power at the moment? Yeah. I think people don't understand it. We haven't done a very good job creating um, public engagement. And then the biggest misconception is that when we do create some engagement and people get excited, they get overexcited. I mean, I can tell you a funny story. I had Boris Johnson. You, you remember him? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's a funny guy, actually. I, I knew him for four or five years because I was chairing the Smart London board after the Olympics, and he was the mayor of London. We worked quite nicely together. I knew him pretty well. So when he became prime minister, I, I personally invited him, and it was the first visit he made as prime minister outside of London. He came to our atomic energy authority, and he walked around and said, you guys are really good. Are you up for it? And we said, yeah, we're up for it. He said, have you got a proposal? I'll get it funded. So we asked him for 405 million, and we had a pocket-ready proposal. We sent it to him, and he didn't even go through the department. And the civil, our civil servants were really pretty annoyed. And we got this, he got this money through the Treasury. He got this program going. So he was pretty entrepreneurial. That night, he went on Facebook. And he said, those clever, brain, brainy people in Oxfordshire are going to make fusion power work in five years' time. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> That's the prime minister. That's Boris Johnson for you. And, you know, it was completely hyping the expectation of what we could achieve. And that was damaging in some ways because what you don't want is then to have to pull back and say, well, your prime minister got it wrong after he's just visited you. But he got so excited about things, he would say things like that. That was his nature. But we're always tr struggling to keep people's interest and excitement when we know we've got to have a patient program. And it's not that easy. I mean, if it was easy, we would have fixed it by now. 
And, and I think that's a, a, a we, we need people to go on these journeys with us. We also need to accelerate and go faster. I accept that. And, you know, what we did with the vaccine, by the way, demonstrates that science can accelerate in a crisis. Back to my first slide, we're in a crisis. And we can't do that from the Atomic Energy Authority or from sitting in SG Innovate. We need governments to really say, we're going to put ourselves on a crisis footing and make this happen and put more resources in. Yeah. Right, yeah, that is indeed very true. And I guess as with any frontier technology innovation that's happening, you always have um, skepticism and then you also have extreme hype on the other end. It's always a challenge of striking a balance. Um, I'd like to stop at this point and see if there are any questions from the audience um, for Professor. Oh, yes, sir. Maybe we can have a mic. Perhaps you could introduce yourself. Yes, Bernard Tan, NUS. Professor Gan, thank you for your talk, which really was quite an eye-opening one because I wasn't quite aware of what the UK government was doing, but it's really heartening to see what is being done in the UK now. Of course, you mentioned all of those 40 or 50 companies that are coming up now. Um, I think we have to recognize that not all of them are based on sort of provable physics. I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. But what I wanted to ask you was that um, many countries are reading the next stage post-eater demo plant. Um, can I ask you whether the next stage would be still multinational or would be a race between nations? And also, may I ask you whether you think that all of these uh, events happening in different countries has shoved ITER out of the way? Or do you still think ITER will be needed to demonstrate ignition and break even before yeah. anything happens? Yeah, the really good question, Bernard. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the small companies, just like any sort of bandwagon of new companies coming in, we'll see huge attrition. So I wouldn't expect many of these to survive. I would expect some of them to specialize in particular areas that are useful for the common purpose. And already you're starting to see them skewed. So some of them have become really strong in magnetic um, control protocols, for example. And I would imagine that as some of the bigger programs start running, they become part of the supply chain. So I think we'll see a, a little morphing in that um, private sector engagement. What I don't want to happen is, because one or two of them might go down, I don't want bad press saying fusion's not going to happen. Because it's to be expected when you have a lot of startups clustering in that there's a risk and some of them will fail. Some of them will go and do other things. It happens everywhere. And, and so we just, be, be, we just need to be careful as a community that this doesn't take out the opportunity. Um, just a, in terms of what's happening, there are 58 or 60 magnetic confinement tokamak machines in operation in the world. So normally when you see something, a radical new system industry emerging, it takes a few decades before you see what we call a dominant design. You know, uh, the, the knowledge starts to consolidate. We saw that with internal combustion engines. We've seen it before in many areas. I don't think we quite know yet the dominant design. My personal view is that some form of this spherical magnetic confinement, you know, the, the, the uh, HTS magnets have now got so good, we've got 25 Tesla coming out, um, which we w was unheard of 10, 15 years ago, um, which makes a big difference to that design. So, you know, my bet at the moment would be that some sort of tokamak magnetic design will, will come through. And that then answers the second, the last question about national versus international. So um, the British government has decided that, rightly or wrongly, we're going to go, go it alone on this, um, trying to be the first of the world in putting a prototype power plant with electricity on the grid. Partly that's because the, the, the design window has collapsed in and we know what we need to do. And therefore, we've got more certainty around it partly because geopolitics has messed up all sorts of other collaborations and it goes too slowly and we just want to get on with it. And because we do have 
a consolidated capability, we want to work off the top of that rather than wait for other countries to catch up or participate in these convoluted programs. Personally, I think we have to do both. I think there's a lot to be learnt still in so many areas that are boringly detailed and I don't know enough about the technicalities and science, but we need to get there. At some point when you're building something like this, you can't just do experiments on the sub-elements. You have to build a full prototype to prove. So one of the outstanding questions that we don't yet know enough about is what we call the blanket, the, the lithium ion blanket that goes around the side of the machine that we use to create the tritium, self-fueling, and we use as the heat converter to make the steam off the top of to make the power plant work. We can make little bits of this in a lab, but we don't know how it's going to perform until we make one with a machine. And so I think the science has progressed to the point now where we have to build this full-scale prototype and make it work. So the big hope with ITER, this huge scientific collaboration, was that, and it still is, that that machine is going to prove a lot of the science. And there are many things that um, we need to know about. For example, we have this thing called a shattered pellet, um, um, which goes in to the, the plasma, which can control the way the plasma works. You, can't, you can do that in theory, but you've got to build a machine to do it in practice. And the ITER machine would show us quite a lot about that. Um, they've just pushed back the timetable again for ITER operating, which is really disappointing. And again, I don't want it to dispirit us, but it is partly because of the incredible difficulty of operating with this such, such a multinational set of partners. Um, and bear in mind that, for example, each of the major partners has a 9% or so investment and stake. They get 100% of the IP. So, you know, China is putting in its 9%, it's taking out these designs and is building its own machines now, which are based on the ITER machine. Now, I don't think that's commercially viable, but it is physically viable to put, put that machine out and make power. Uh, if the Chinese don't mind whether it's commercially viable or not, but it's going to work, then good luck. Let's see what happens. So we, we're in a strange place with the international collaboration. Um, we, we're not going to get through this without international collaboration, that's for sure. And we work very closely with the Princeton Particle Physics Lab in the US. We work with a number of European partners. And we have uh, a whole lo lot of connections around the world in the UK. But we are intent on making our own machine work as well. And, and we're, so it's co opetition time. You know, we're in the race for ourselves. But we're in the race for the world and we want to collaborate with everyone else as well. And let's see how that goes. Yeah. yeah thank you so much for your question. There's one here. Uh, Professor, thank you for sharing with us the very exciting story. I'm Ching Yang with the Unicorns for Good, where I help out in my spare time. And I'm really interested in how you have managed in five years to really uh, excited the fusion power industry because for, for unicorns for good, that's the kind of things that we're interested in. So could you share with us what are some of the effort, the ingredients, the directions to, to make that happen, right? The science to technology to commercialization. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope, actually, you've probably seen it in some of the pictures. And you know, a lot of it was there. It was just not being made publicly visible. That's one half of the answer. The other half of the answer is that there's just been a phenomenal number of breakthroughs in the last five years. You know, and those breakthroughs have really created excitement and, and they're genuine scientific breakthroughs. So um, the two things combined, the fact that we weren't telling our story to anyone, you know, this was a little forgotten place in the corner of Oxfordshire that was just getting on with its job. And I came in. Its website was pretty awful. It's not that great now. But, you know, it didn't put any resources into communications. It didn't think like that. It was a bunch of scientists. And one of the things I had to do was change the board because the board was full of... And there's nothing wrong with these, the people on the board at all. They were great scientists. They were really decent people. Um, they, but they didn't have necessarily... And they knew they, it was time for something different here. We needed people with commercial, we needed people with industrial, we needed people with public communications. 
We've got enough scientists. In fact, the, the scientists who are working in the machines are the best ones anyway, so let them do that. And we needed to put some other leadership around the top of this. And all I did was, with, with my colleagues and with the Secretary of State and, and people I report to in government, saw that opportunity and started to mix it up a little bit. And you know, now we, we have a much more balanced view and, and we're communicating a bit better. And we need to do much more of that. Uh, one more question. Hi there. Uh, my name is Asim. I'm a venture architect with uh, Striber. And um, as you were sharing about this uh, disruptive technology, uh, so to speak, um, one question that kept coming up in my mind is uh, going back to your first slide, which really created this uh, crisis, uh, you know, inside all of us, and also your second or third slide where you shared about uh, how many windmills do we need to build on a daily basis and what is the cost of building them. Uh, I'm just trying to understand, and I think a lot of people in the room as well, uh, where do we put the promise of fusion in terms of is it, uh, you know, a pipe dream? <laughs> And if it is a pipe dream, then we should be thinking about getting the windmills up. We should be thinking about getting the other projects up. Uh, and, I, and I guess it's important for us to understand, uh, like, uh, until we get to the point where the commercialization of uh, fusion power you know, becomes a reality, what are the changes we need to bring about as a society? And uh, you know, not put all our hopes into just one uh, technology Is that working? Yeah. You're completely right about this. Um, we need to do absolutely everything we can with all of the technologies and the better management of our resources right now to reduce the impact on um, the environment. There's no doubt. And fusion at this point is only going to play a very small part, will play no part in the next 20 years. Um, by 2100, the end of this century. Given what we can see of the capabilities of fusion now, and we, we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, we can see what we need to do to make a, a working fusion machines. You know, it's completely plausible to think that 20%, 25% of the whole base load of the world could be powered by fusion. Could be more if we really took it that seriously. So my question back is, how do we get from today, not to 2050, but 2100, where we start to get a base, uh, an, an industrial base and a technology base working that gives us unlimited energy. Bear in mind that this produces a very high grade of heat um, that you can do all sorts of other things with. You can create the hydrogen economy with a fusion machine without depleting the planet's resources, right? And we, we're still going to need mixed forms of energy. So hydrogen is, is a form of energy store. And you know, it could be extremely useful for shipping, for example. And I, I think we've got to think in that way that what's the roadmap out to a much better world where the world is going to need more energy and it's got to be clean. And the second way of thinking about this is if I ask you when is the right time, best time to plant a tree? Well, the best time was 20 years ago, because you want to see it as a tree, right? Because it takes time. And so if we don't get on with this now, you know, the next generation are going to sit in this room and say, what the hell were they playing at? They, they were on the cusp of getting this thing going, and then they got distracted or something, or they just lost their nerve, or they stopped working. You know, we actually have to go faster now and get through these last scientific and technical hurdles, build the industrial capacity, and make this thing work. You know, that's what happened with the vaccine. You know, I came into Oxford just as we were getting onto that vaccine. And if I had asked them four years ago, five years ago, I know these people very well. They're very, very serious scientists. How long does it take to make a vaccine for a coronavirus? They say 12 years, 10 or 12 years. Then if you had to accept that, there would be a lot more deaths in the world after this crisis. And what they did in nine months would have normally taken 12 years. And what they did was, instead of doing sequential process and going through approval gates, stage gates, with each test, 
they did a concurrent set of processes and they took risk in the process. They didn't take risk with people's lives or with the environment, they just took risk on the process. And by doing that in parallel, they shortened the time scale and they got the result. And I think we can do that, but to take risk in process, you've got to have government permission with stuff like this. And of course, politicians are only there for a short period and they don't like negatives. So if one of those risks come out as a negative, it won't, won't be a big deal. We're not gonna kill anyone, we're not gonna cause any environmental problem. We're just gonna fail a little bit in one of the processes. They don't want it to happen on their watch. So they still put these sequential approval gates in front of us. And I have big arguments with them, right? Um, and the other problem for me in the UK is I've had seven secretaries of state in five years. It's a revolving door. It's a revolving door of people who don't know as much about fusion as you do tonight because I, you've heard my talk. So can you imagine the bright people, Secretary of State, many of them have, have been trained at Oxford, and they come in, it takes me six or eight weeks to get them invited, they come and visit, then they know what you know, and then they start thinking, how can we help? And then they've moved on, and I have to get another one in. Well, how the hell are we going to get this job done? Because we need leadership. And, you know, we can... Ian Chapman, when you meet him, is just an amazing chief exec. He really has that forthright leadership to get this job done. I can back him up as chairman. But we need long-sighted and fast political leadership on this. And actually, where it's going to crack through is, is whichever country can get that done quickest, um, it will succeed. OK, we have more questions. Hello. <coughs> Hi, Professor Gan. I just had a question. Do you have, have you heard of, or do you know of any sort of really exciting uh, possibilities for, that are unlocked um, from nuclear fusion? Because if you forgive me for saying so, you know, just now you said by, you know, by 2100, we'll have 20, 25% of the world base load, right? And that's, that's great, but it's also kind of boring. Um, I wanted to know, you know, I, I wanted to know, like, do we have, does fusion uniquely unlock any things like flying cars or rockets, you know, that I can fly from Singapore to Oxford to have a pint with my, you know, with my tutor and, and then come back for dinner, you know, that kind of thing. Like, uh, is there anything, is there anything like that that fusion unlocks? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know when the first uh, wind generator was created, don't you? about 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago. So, you know, sometimes these things um, do take far too long and, you know, we get excited. So I, I have to keep you to think about my 2100 issue, even if it's boring. But then on the journey, so we have a, we have a startup on our campus called Reaction Engines. And um, this is like a scramjet type technology that will allow you to do super supersonic flight and um, that company is doing really well and it, you can look online and look at how their technology works but a lot of that capability the reason why they're on our campus is that they're working with temperatures uh, they're working with forces um, and they're working with materials that link very closely to what we're using um, and so maybe they're going to deliver you to london in half an hour at some point but, you know, I think, actually, does, does the world need that or does it need fusion energy? It needs fusion energy first. And you'll see, you'll see many other things that we can create. Um, you know, some of the um, super things that will happen with the magnets that are being designed now. You wouldn't necessarily naturally develop those magnets if you didn't have these big programs. Um, and then the spillover effects of that are just going to be fantastic. Um, so, yeah, there will be exciting um, uh, sidelines uh, that might for some people be more exciting than the real thing uh, i'm trying to balance both of those things and i want to see both of them happen it, they'll happen in different time scales yeah oh, thank you uh, we have some questions here Hi, David. Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. My name's Nikki Kemp, and I work in um, financing the energy transition. So um, can't promise any money, unfortunately, uh, because uh, it's still... I work in the private sector financing, and really not there yet. But um, that's actually not the reason why I'm here tonight. I'm actually here tonight because my son couldn't make it. 
um, because he's on a school trip in Laos um, helping save elephants. Um, but he, he is um, reading physics in his final year at school and, uh, and, and he's writing a paper, his, his uh, main, main thesis paper on um, fusion and in particular the plasma, something to do with plasma and tokamak. I, I couldn't actually tell you what that is because I'm not a physicist. But anyway, he, it's a long story, but he, uh, he was really um, very keen to be here and, and really wanted to know two things. So it's really a question from him, two questions from him. Uh, he would like to know, um, uh, and you've kind of alluded to this a number of times now with the timeframes around commercialization. Um, and, and I guess I'm gonna overlay my version of, of the question with, if you talk about the acceleration of commercialization needing the urgency and the regulatory environment to support that acceleration, and you look at the 12 years to nine months story around the um, vaccine, the COVID vaccine, what's the time compression that you could see in developing commercialized fusion energy um, if you're using a similar scale? What's the 12 years to nine month story for fusion? And the second is a very personal one for him, and that is how does he get involved in what you're doing? <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, I think actually we are seeing private sector finance getting more and more interested. I did an event in New York with Citigroup um, not very long ago, and we had a really big turnout from the private sector, and Citi itself is looking quite seriously at this. So um, I've just written a paper for their, one of their journals on fusion that they're, they're, they're trying to get finances put into. So I think it's, a, it's starting to come into the interview. Um, the word tokamak, by the way, is a Russian word, and it means some, some sort of translation is a toroidal chamber with magnetic forces. And that is what I was showing you. The, the two different types I showed you, one is the donut one with the more expensive magnets and larger. And the other one is the one we're designing now in the UK, which is the apple, the spherical one. Um, and can I just detour and tell you where it came from? Because this is a beautiful story of science collaborating in uh, geopolitical nightmare time. So in the middle of the 1960s, or early 1960s, if you remember your history, um, I was probably too young to remember it in reality. Uh, the world was on the cusp of nuclear war between the US and Russia. And this was the really the depths of the Cold War. And just outside Moscow was a fantastic physics lab that had developed a machine to make a plasma. And they claimed the hottest temperature ever developed. And uh, the, the Americans didn't believe them said the results are fictitious. And there was a, an international peace group of scientists called Pugwash. And, and the uh, director of the Atomic Energy Authority and the director of the Russian lab were both members. And they met at this Pugwash meeting to talk about how scientists could work for world peace. And the Russian director said to the British director, we've made this temperature, but no one believes us. You've created Thompson scattering um, uh, uh, sensing device to measure high temperature. So this was a breakthrough that was published in Nature from the Atomic Energy Authority as a way of measuring these. You can't put a thermometer in something that's that hot, right? It doesn't exist. So you've got to do it with lasers and, and, and other um, uh, means. And uh, so he invited the British team to go to Russia in the middle of the Cold War in 1964 to go and measure this temperature. And they couldn't fly there because the, uh, of the Cold War. So they had to go to Pakistan and get on Pakistan Airline. And the, the equipment weighed five tons. And they had to put it together. It took six months. And five of them went there. And they independently measured this temperature. And they verified it. And it got published in Nature. And the Russian scientists were so happy with them that they said, look, we love you guys. Here's how we designed the machine. You take the design away. And they came back to Cullum, where our Atomic Energy Authority is, and built one of those machines. They built a tokamak machine there. A year later, Princeton Particle Physics Lab in the US changed its machine design to a tokamak. So in the depths of Cold War, when you have geopolitical nightmare time, scientists collaborate. 
That didn't answer your question. Um, commercialization, urgency, how do you get there quicker? Well, you name one major source of energy that didn't cost more than the incumbent way of making it when it was first introduced in the market. There is none. Photovoltaics were too expensive. Wind turbines were too expensive. You know, you, you cannot get there without getting over that hump um, of introduction, and you need to have things that will propel you through that. So you either need government subsidy, or you need to regulate out the things that are causing pollution. If you put the real cost of the way we make energy on the table, which includes all the depletion of the environment and loss of biodiversity and everything else, you couldn't afford to carry on with the lights on in this room. So, you know, we're not going to get there without government intervention, but then nothing else came into the market that's a big system infrastructure change without government intervention. And that's going to be the, the thing that's going to change that commercialization pathway. Um, you know, we're looking at a 15-year projection of our timescale at the moment. Um, we can accelerate. We can take five or six years off that if we um, really were forced to uh, or allowed to go concurrent. And if we were in a real crisis mode, we'd take more off. You know, if Elon Musk or Larry Ellison walked through the door and said, I'm going to do this using all the recipes we've got at the Atomic Energy Authority, and I don't care if it's going to cost us 20 billion, like they do about, you know, going into space, we get there. And there's enough talent around. Um, how does he get involved? Uh, just keep getting excited. You're gonna have, he's going to have to do his exams, university, masters or PhD. It's going to cost you a lot of money, this. And he's going to get an internship in one of the labs. He's going to have to come and visit. He's, there's so many sub-elements, you know, uh, through the mechatronics, through the sensors, through the digital, through the material side. He's just got to wait and see which is the best one for his appetite. Um, you know, it doesn't all have to, have to be plasma physics and string theory maths and stuff to, to get there. Hi. Um, hi, I'm a sustainability consultant, and um, in my job, we think about trade-offs every day. Um, so actually, that's one of the questions that I really like to ask. I have to, I hope that's not greedy, and I hope my questions resonate with everyone in the room. Um, but my first question is, what are the potential or hidden trade-offs of this energy? We've talked so much about the limitless possibilities, but when you think about, say, hydropower, which is also another type of renewable energy, there are hidden trade-offs when it comes to, say, human rights of the surrounding communities. Um, and my second question actually has to do with um, the loading fusion energy onto energy grids and whether there are any potential issues there. Because I understand that right now with renewable energy and the inconsistency of um, wind and solar, um, it creates issues. There's a disconnect between supply and demand. So I'm, I, I don't think that that will be a similar issue for fusion energy or fusion no. power. Yeah, yeah. just okay. curious. So first one on trade-offs. Uh, I may be a bit blind to this, but I don't see so many trade-offs with this form of power as there are with others because it doesn't require a big footprint on the land. You don't need a big exclusion zone around it. So the site I showed you is not a, a nuclear site, registered site. We are able to choose an ordinary site and it's only going to be a very small part of that site when we build the machine. So you're getting a, the, the densest form of energy known, uh, which means that you're not going to take, com be competing on land you're not competing for raw materials very greatly because we don't need much and they're readily available. Um, so I don't think this is a big disruption in terms of trade-offs like that. And we're not polluting, right? Um, so I think from that side, it, it's a softer sell than most types where you've got trade-offs. You know, where, where I live, we have one of the big wind farms. I look out to the ocean and I used to look out on the blackness at night, and now I see all the little red flashing lights. I think, well, at least I'm getting, you know, uh, renewable energy because it's always windy out there. But I have to put up with the trade-off that I'm my my vision at night is disturbed, and I see an industrial plant rather than nature. But you know, that we have to go through these things. Um, on the um, en energy onto the grid, the way we're planning to do this is exactly the same way that you would do it with a coal-fired power station or a gas-fired power station, um, or an oil-fired power station. 
which is basically the, the fusion machine is like your boiler that is just used to heat up the water and then you use a traditional power generation turbine balancer plant with known technology. Now, let, let's figure out getting the boiler working properly and then we might innovate a bit more or, or while we're doing it, we might get a, 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 a more effective way of making the electricity off the top of this. But at the moment, we know we're produ producing such a super grade of heat um, that we can already uh, produce a lot of electricity off a small plant and we can also do district heating and all sorts of other stuff, make hydrogen. So um, I, I don't think the energy onto the grid is the big difficult bit. I think making your boiler work is the big difficult bit. Yeah. Sorry. Um, before we go on, I think we'll take the last question because I'm also mindful of time. We want to have enough time for everyone to network. So uh, the gentleman, uh, your last you. question. Thank you. Good evening, Professor Gan. My name is Steve. I just Since this is the last question, I just want to hear your views or the challenges and the reality of this whole thing. I think if I would summarize it, there are at least three parts to it. First, the scientists. Second would be the politician and the activists. And the third part would be the bankers or the financiers. So my understanding is that this is very much at a prototype stage. So if we succeed, when and if, I suppose, when it will succeed, since as a scientist, you will be confident that you will succeed, then how do we then move on to the next step to ensure that safety is primary, and because the regulatory framework we have to develop from there. And then the third part being that we need to convince people that they, they can, they, there are benefits from funding it. In particular, no disrespect, of course, to anyone in this room who are involved in fossil fuel industry, for example. Why would those in the fossil fuel abandon all and say, let's support a new form of energy? Because there must be some kind of interest involved in one way or another. So in, in short, just want to hear your views on in terms of the challenges and the reality, the yeah. timeline overall. Thank you. Yeah. So um, put, instead of having those challenges sequential, put them concurrent. We've already started that in the UK by creating a regulator, the only country in the world to create a regulator, ahead of our need for the regulator. And you know that's just tremendous because it gets that one out of the way. What, what you need is certainty on the things you can get certainty on quickly. And we know what the risks look like in general for the public and the environment, so we got that piece done. And, you know, we're already talking to the bankers and the finance people, and we don't want to wait until we've got a beautiful working machine before we let them know and we need some financing. So we're bringing them in concurrently. So some of these things now, um, we're, where we can accelerate and we have the ability to, we're, we're making that happen. Um, and, and I think that um, then starts to propel things because you, you, you answer other questions as you go along. That's where I want to get to with more concurrent activity to shorten the time frame. And I think we'll get there with some of that. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Really insightful session with Professor. Um, I'd just like to ask you, you know, just for your closing remarks, I think many people in the audience here are involved in deep tech, are deep tech innovators themselves. And these are quite crazy times we live in, right? With geopolitics, all kinds of challenges. What advice would you like to leave them with? Keep going. I mean, I think it's a really good time to be in deep tech. Frankly, I mean, I, as an aside line, I'm quite involved in venture investing and, and mentoring startups and have had several and floated on the stock exchange. Um, it's a difficult time if you're in the growth, the late stage growth phase of a company because your valuations will be all over the place and you might be sitting on cash and you're wondering where your next run, funding round and it's difficult to exit at the moment. Um, all of that stuff I get. And, you know, we've got to wait for two or three years to clear through. Um, and some of the, the later stage companies are hurting a bit at the moment. But if you look at the early stage, you look at the, the deal flow, the idea flow coming out of some of our universities, some of our labs, you look at what's happening in AI, um, scary stuff and good stuff, uh, it's a really good time to be looking and uh, thinking about investment, thinking about working in deep tech startups. And uh, the only advice is, it always takes a bit longer than you want it to. Um, you just gotta keep that patience and you need a community that's gonna support you to, to get it right. And, and don't sell too quickly. You know, a lot of our people in the UK have sold out before they should have done, so they didn't realize all the value they could have done. And, and so that's another thing about patience. You've gotta grow the business. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And please enjoy the networking session. Round of applause, please, for David and Sarania. Uh
Maven Serum, may I just ask you to remain on stage? The, the rest, you can start networking, you know.